It's Martin Shkreli, and this is episode five of This Week in Investing and Finance. Um, it's May 21st, and I, I'm delighted to be here with you. Hopefully this will be a little under an hour. Um, yeah, so let's get uh, right into it. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting from this week was the crazy corruption uh, and intrigue that we've, uh, political intrigue that we've seen. Um, the Brazilian uh, markets have now had three presidents in a row caught in major corruption um, scandals. And so the Brazilian uh, Bovespa index was down 10%, which I kind of thought my, my computer programs had like uh, broken or something when I saw it, it was such a large, um, such a large drop. But um, Brazil's going through a lot right now. But you know, what I've seen is that these countries that go through these things t typically end up coming on the, end up on the right side. You know, it used to be business as usual. So the fact that these are seen as great crimes and corruption seen as this really terrible thing that needs to be stamped out. I think that's the sign, as I've said many times, of if you look at it even handed in an even handed way, it's actually sort of um, a net positive, I think, because it shows the maturity of a country and I think South Korea is going through this as well. So this seems to be an ongoing theme. Um, it's really scary when you bring in somebody to clean up the corruption and he's just as corrupt as the last person. Um, but uh, in any event, I think that there's, um, you know, something kind of interesting about what's going on in Brazil. And again, maybe there's some values there. Maybe there aren't. I'm not so sure. But uh, there aren't too many healthcare stocks in Brazil, so, so I, or tech stocks for that matter. So I haven't really spent a ton of time on Brazilian equities. But um, it is something that that's somewhat interesting. Um, at least when you see it's it's really big market. I'm sure some of you may recall the top the term brick. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Well, Brazil and Russia haven't kept up with India and China, but they're still uh, they're still gigantic um, markets and opportunities out there. Anyway, in the United States, we've had our own little uh, mini scandal. Not quite the level of Brazil, but markets uh, anticipate the future, and there's some heightened risk that we may have a Brazil-like scandal. And so, is it a witch hunt or is it something more serious? Well, the bond market doesn't really. I trust the bond market. Um, more people than more people. Um, yeah, BRICS. Sometimes they'd say uh, BRIC and SK, or BRIC and Mexico. Even um, BRIC uh, SKT with Turkey. Um, so you know, there's tons of BRIC derivatives, but um, certainly BRIC is the major block, at least. Um, again, changing quite a bit lately. You know, people just drop off to Brazil or Russia, and it's mostly just an India-China phenomenon now for emerging markets. Anyway. In the United States, we've had our Trump, uh, more Trump problems. And again, I trust the bond markets a lot more than I trust the stock markets. And I think most um, professional investors do the same. Their um, stock markets are almost all professional investors. Uh, bond markets are almost all professional investors who are usually a little bit more seasoned than the stock market, which is a little more speculative. Um, so there isn't too much panic. I saw the, the yield curve flatten a bit. Um, where the tens came in from, I want to say two four to two three or something like that, two six to two five. It's about a ten basis point tightening on the far end, but um, either way, you know, things seem pretty fine um, on that end. And you know, I'm not, I'm no political analyst, but the, you know, I'd say it's somewhere between a big witch hunt and serious, but you know, not 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 yet to the level of anything too crazy. And again, um, these things seldom have long term consequences, so. Anyway, I saw a really fa fascinating article about inflation, um, and it said that uh, wireless plans, which is a major, you know, kind of a cost everyone has, and if you think about the cost of um, some of the things that we've, the way we've thought about inflation, whether it be food or energy as major sort of components of that, housing, so forth, um, some of these things we want inflation. I think not everyone wants housing cost inflation, but people, when we buy real estate, we, we, we would like our real estate to, to inflate. Uh, not if you're paying rent, I suppose, but uh, if you if you own the asset, you like inflation. So anyway, one place where we don't want any inflation is things like wireless plan costs. And I haven't noticed it personally in my bill, but certainly um, the CPI um, component of wireless plan costs is now 13% year over year, which is really um, an enormous um, drop if you think about it. And this was a, a sudden drop in the last few years where we have press and price wars and wireless plans. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that technology is supposed to bring about that not a lot of people understand is deflation. 
and a world without inflation or at least or or less inflation but maybe even huge deflation could be um have really dramatic implications as you can imagine for instance bonds or um financial instruments that have um um fixed uh fixed coupons and fixed returns of capital so if there's deflation uh, bonds are extremely extremely valuable whereas if they're um significant inflation bonds become less valuable and stocks have bond-like characteristics as well um, we can talk about further time but I think that there's um, something about inflation dynamics that's really different <laughs> uh, to, that we're living in today versus the last 50 uh, or 100 years um, and it really is, is happening as we speak um, maybe I'm crazy but I think that there's uh, um, things like autonomous uh, vehicles could uh, change our transportation costs and our living costs really dramatically. And that's sort of the goal of technology, right? It's sort of um, technology reduced communication costs to a certain extent, but you know, our wireless costs are finally maybe starting to drop. There's this sort of lagging effect. Um, things like Facebook, things like um, um, uh, Twitter and, and other um, social media aspects. You know, a lot of people prefer now to use um, those services instead of voice services. So wireless costs are dropping dramatically. I don't know if that'll continue or not, but um, you know, it's really fascinating to sort of see um, this sort of uh, dramatic cost reduction taking place in certain areas. And I think transportation costs are, I think one of the largest costs um, people have sort of per capita. And if that drops dramatically, we could have a really crazy deflationary period where asset prices kind of go crazy um, and it's just something to watch out for again I think um, great great investors think about inflation quite a lot um, it's really maybe the most important part of finance and um, very few stock speculators out there really care about inflation <laughs> um, in fact some professionals as well um, who are good stock pickers but don't really think about um, the cost of money uh, and uh, changes of, of prices of goods in general. Um, really, really important here. So anyway, we'll talk about Bitcoin in a second, actually. Uh, ASCO is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's a big conference. It's our cancer conference for, for medicine. It's going on uh, in the next two weeks in Chicago. And uh, I will not be attending, but um, I might send uh, an employee of mine or two. Um, there's a lot of important data out here coming out of this conference. Um, if you're in the Chicago area or if you can get to the Chicago area, I highly recommend you attend. Um, we'll talk about attending conferences in a minute. But um, cancer is is really important part of the healthcare industry. In fact, I'd say uh, sort of a quarter or a third of, of all of healthcare is, is related to cancer as we speak. And I'm being pretty general there, but um, uh, uh, certainly in the biotech pharma world, everybody is focused on cancer. And uh, those fo that focus, you know, sort of translates into the, the hospital and physician and, and uh, the rest of the world, the payer world. So anyway, the ASCO is the, the annual conference where we get to see the, some of the great new um, uh, progress that's being made in cancer. And this year is a little quieter um, than every other year. We still have sort of PD-1 aftershock for many, many years. But... Um, Certainly the top of the list here for me is the Insight uh, IDO data, and we'll have to talk about that extensively, but there, there was some positive data from Insight. I'm actually short Insight, which is a problem. Um, Roche's uh, Genentech is supposed to be the leader in cancer, but you know they've sort of been seen as having been a step behind. Uh, Loxo is a company I'll talk about in a minute. And then Pfizer has a PARP drug, and a couple, Abbott has a PARP drug. A couple of companies have PARP drugs that are going to co compete with Tesaro. And finally, maybe we'll see some success from Bristol Myers of Lag3 and get her further immuno oncology concept. So, cancer is slowing down a little bit, I think. Um, we're sort of in this post PD1 twilight where it's hard to understand exactly what's, what's happening um, and what the next sort of big thing is going to be in cancer since PD1. Um, and we're still, quite frankly, trying to understand PD1. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to sort of digest uh, at ASCO. It's kind of a a conference I like to avoid because it's so, so big and crazy, but it's a great conference to go to um, if you're trying to learn about uh, Wall Street or, or medicine uh, or both. ASCO is a, a great place to be if you're trying to build some network in the financial community or the pharmaceutical community. I, I don't think you can beat uh, ASCO. 
So some stocks over the week. Uh, we'll talk about El Nylum in a little bit. Um, my favorite stock, Regeneron, is, is continuing to go up, which is great. Uh, one of my favorite stocks, Alexion, is not going up. It's going down. And I really like um, Alexion quite a lot. And we'll talk about that further. But um, they actually have a Brazilian corruption problem right now, too. Uh, and I think they, I mean, they fired their CEO and CFO. Um, so I think that um, any sort of issues will be remediated. And Brazil is in this sort of hypersensitive, um, um, hypersensitive sort of place when it comes to um, corruption. So it's just sort of something to think about. Um, I did want to go back real quick. Um, I'll go through the rest of these. Uh, Malacrot had a sort of weird short attack, which was interesting. Um, I don't think shorting Malacrot makes sense. I've said this for many, many years. Um, it's sort of come down with the Spec Pharma world, but uh, I don't agree with the recent sort of same old bear thesis. Um, Avexis is one of my favorite stocks as well. It's also come down a little bit. I actually doubled my position. We'll talk about that when we get to the portfolio. There's some manufacturing fears, and I feel comfortable that they'll be resolved um, um, and that the company can do a phase three trial or, or some kind of abbreviated phase two for, for FDA approval. Acadia keeps dropping. I'm short Acadia. Horizon, I initiated a position um, where I think the stock will bounce back. There's a bunch of weird moves out there that I'm sort of looking into that you can take a look at. But one thing I'll note um, is, you know, with the Trump, uh, with sort of the Trump shock, um, markets were down, I think, 2% in one day and, and people got really afraid. And I got, I sensed a lot of fear from investors um, that is a little worrisome. You know, a 2% decline in the market should not um, spook anybody. Um, I come from a period where, you know, a 5% five, 5 down in one week or 10% down in one month is, is, I wouldn't say common, but that that's the kind of behavior that, that might want to might spook you. So if you haven't shorted stocks ever, it's a good time to learn. Um, I don't think stocks go up in a straight line. Uh, I think shorting is a great tool against um, being exposed to beta. Um, and I think that it's often very easy to find shorts relative to longs. So um, try to try to find some short stocks and, and you can really pick up your investing game quite a bit if you are if you become afraid of, of the market going down 1% or 2% or you look at your portfolio and all you have is longs. I think that's a really kind of really uh, important thing to do. It's, it's kind of crazy to only be long stocks. And um, certainly if you don't have any other asset classes as well, um, like real estate or or some other sort of bonds or, or private equity or something like that. So anyway, um, you know, I think it's important to avoid beta if you, uh, if you, um, if you can. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of medical and investor meetings and here, here are a bunch of them. And this is actually kind of a, I wouldn't say this is going to be controversial, but it's a little bit um, interesting. A lot of people ask me how to, how to sort of get ahead and how to um, meet people and how to make opportunities for themselves. Well, uh, I would never advocate that anyone sneak into a conference, but again, the UBS conference starts tomorrow. It's in New York City. Um, I know people, I mean, I'm talking about adults, professionals, that will sneak into these things <laughs> uninvited. And... You know, they just introduce themselves, shake hands, and, and meet people. And some people will sort of print out business cards, and they, they'll, they'll say, oh, Joe Schmo invest, is Investment Corp, and they'll get registered. And if they don't get registered, you know, they get turned away, and they go home, and that's that's fine. But um, I think that there's, there's sort of this uh, um, uh, a large number of people that actually do attend these things uninvited, and, and it's not such a terrible, um, a terrible idea. To sort of do again the medical meetings are a little more sophisticated but again I know a lot of people that sneak into these too so you know it's just something that you might uh, you know want to do um, and uh, again I, I don't I won't give you hints about how to get in and what to do but you know you'll kind of have to learn those on your own and again I, I don't think of them as uh, you know I certainly again maybe not uninvited completely but you know going to these conferences can help you a, a little bit so anyway something to think about um, the medical meetings, again, uh, I'm not so sure. Some of these are in other countries and so forth, but usually if you're living in a big city or you can get to a big city, there'll, there'll be some kind of investment conference, the Goldman Sachs one, uh, um, et cetera. So uh, J&J &J had an annual uh, pharmaceutical 
investment day. It was, it's a full day of webcasts. I listened to most of it. Um, they have a lot to say on a lot of different subjects. If uh, they do a pharma one every two years and in every other year, and the every other year they do um, a consumer and medical device conference. And um, that's also publicly, sometimes publicly attended. And anyway, uh, it's in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and they had theirs, I think, last week. Um, and so one of the things that they pointed out is the flu um, is a disease state that um, has almost no drugs, um, um, sort of uh, other than um, Tamiflu. Uh, there are very few different, uh, there are no other mechanisms of actions other than neuraminidase, which is what Tamiflu binds to reduce flu. And there are actually tons of deaths from flu. Um, and obviously the patients who die from flu are people with who are immunocompromised, they're elderly patients, they're very, very young patients. Um, but even patients who, who, are, who are adults uh, have severe flu can would, would rather have less symptoms, obviously. So it's a big market, and I actually, J&J &J bought a drug from uh, Vertex, and I actually bid, um, this is many years ago, so I can sort of say that, uh, I actually bid for that drug as well. J&J &J, uh, outpaid the company I was working uh, for, outbid, uh, was outbid by J&J. &J. So in any event, uh, flu is, is antivirals are, are sort of a trivial, maybe an overstatement, but a relatively straightforward um, drug development pathway. It's not like oncology or something like that. You have the, the, the influenza genome. You can you know, do crystallography on those proteins and, and make very, very effective uh, antivirals. Um, there's been just an expectation that this wouldn't be a big market. And again, the company wisely, j, &J wisely pointed out that... Um, um, that uh, um, more people die from flu than almost any other cancer, not combined, of course, but any individual cancer like prostate cancer or, or breast cancer or something like that. So it really is a, a big killer and a big cost center. Um, and you could easily have a blockbuster drug, I think, um, with the flu antiviral. And there's very little competition. I mean, half of biotech is focused on cancer. Nobody's focused on flu. So I think there's, there's a big opportunity there. And I'm always proud when J&J &J copies my stuff, or, or I wouldn't say copies, because they're not actually copying it, but I'm always happy when J&J, &J, um, many years later, sort of focuses on a space that I was focused on. Uh, depression was one, uh, ketamine and depression was one, where I was shocked to hear J&J &J sort of doing it simultaneously. I have a lot of respect for Johnson & Johnson. You can't really understand healthcare without Johnson & Johnson. So uh, it's important, if you, if you care about pharmaceuticals, this is uh, one of the companies you just have to listen to. They also have an HIV, um, uh, two HIV cures. So one is a, a therapeutic vaccine, so in other words, post-infection. And that had some interesting data where they reduced the set point um, of, of, uh, of uh, treatment interruption. Uh, the amount of viral load um, was reduced substantially um, after therapy. And a prophylactic vaccine, which was more impressive, where they had 60 or 70% um, reduction in, um, or 60, 70% protection from a very, very high dose uh, given to um, primates. So they're in human trials and we'll sort of see, um, we'll sort of see uh, what happens, uh, you know, once, uh, once um, the human results come out. But th this is a really compelling, you know, opportunity for Johnson & Johnson. It's not in my model, but if they ever had an HIV product like that, it could be many, many billions of revenue Possibly one of the biggest drugs ever, um, needless to say. So hopefully J&J &J gets that uh, squared away and we'll be very excited. Exciting. One stock I took a look at this week was uh, Loxo, and I thought it was pretty compelling. Um, they have some pretty remarkable data. I think 60, 70, 80% response rates um, with rapid tumor regression. Um, so at the very least, it's, I think, fairly valued. You know, it's a billion, billion two market cap. So there's some pretty high expectations that this will be, um, you know, a drug that gets FDA approval and so forth. And if you look at Zalcori and some of the other really mutation-specific drugs, they don't sell that well. Um, so one has to be sort of cautious about a billion-plus market cap, um, and we've only seen seven patients. However, it looks like unlike Zalcori with ALK mutations, there are a lot more track. This is TRK. It's pronounced track. There are a lot more track mutants out there and it's across a diverse array of tumor types so we're still looking at this but I think this could be um, a long I just have to sort of get more comfortable with it I never like to buy a stock after um, 
a short period of analysis. I haven't looked at Loxo really ever before. Uh, I looked at Ignita, one of their competitors, um, and Ignita wasn't too exciting. Um, so I like to spend you know, 50, 100, 200 hours on something before I make an investment. Um, it's a little hard otherwise to, to really just jump in with your money and you know you could, could be holding a, the bag, as they say, if, if you mess up. So I like to, to go slowly on these things. And that means that sometimes I miss opportunities, but that's, that's also part of, you know, that's part of investing. So anyway, um, if there are a lot of track mutations out there that drive cancer, Loxo could certainly be a big long, but you know we'll, we'll certainly, we'll see. Uh, all right, here's some of my current opinions. So this uh, slide is getting a little bit, a little bit bigger. Um, um, the um, undervalued list is still a little bigger than the overvalued list, which is a little frustrating. Um, the fair, fairly valued list isn't long enough. Um, so I can imagine that probably about half of these undervalued stocks may not actually be undervalued, which I'm a little nervous about. Um, I have to work a little harder to find more stocks. Here's a list of stocks that probably there's a few over undervalued stocks in this list. We'll have to see in a minute. Um, for now, I block so as, as fairly valued. I put J&J &J in here. I think it's, it's somewhat undervalued. It's pretty uh, unclear. So we'll certainly see how this all pans out. But uh, some people ask me about Eli Lilly. I think Eli Lilly is, is fairly valued. Um, Teva is really kind of interesting at the moment. I think this company, Ultragenics, is interesting. Um, Prothena is really interesting. Um, Sarepta is always interesting. Um, so we'll have to sort of see what happens. But I think most, again, most stocks should be, when you evaluate, most stocks should be fairly valued. The market is relatively efficient. Um, Biopharma is often inefficient, so it's nice that there's Maybe some stocks poking out, but uh, you know, um, one has to be very careful about seeing every stock as really overvalued or really undervalued. So anyway, uh, those are a few thoughts. And if you ever um, think you know I should look at some stock, just let me know, and I'll pop it into evaluating, or I'll put it into my normal workflow. Here's the portfolio. Um, it was a it was a rough week uh, for me. Uh, so the return now is about 1% for the year. Again, I just really started this portfolio recently. So the returns are a little better than maybe they appear. Um, Alexion is my biggest investment. It had a really bad week, um, but I, I'm confident it will bounce back. Um, Gilead, I think, is a really uncommonly good opportunity. It also had a, a sort of rough week, and I think uh, it's sort of remarkable. Um, in terms of value and risk and things like that, I think it's a really incredible, incredible uh, opportunity. Regeneron, of course, is more of a kind of a, um, a growth, sexy kind of opportunity, and, and obviously it's done very well, and it'll probably continue to do very well. Bristol Myers is, again, much more of a sort of, um, the investments are weighted according to their percentage. Um, that's the... <laughs> Thought that was clear. Uh, that's the. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't. I don't want to make you. I don't want to make you seem stupid or something. But that's what this percentage thing means. That's the percentage of the portfolio. Um, uh, Avexis, I doubled my position. So the bold ones are changes. I doubled my position in Avexis. Um, I think it's a it's a attractive price. The thing about some of these stocks is, they often. Um, yeah, so we were up 1.8% last week, and now we're up 1.2% or 1.3%. So we'll keep tracking that uh, week by week, but um, that's kind of where we're at. So anyway, um, the thing about stocks like Avexis is I've traded these kinds of things my whole life, and one of the um, one of the, the kind of weird things that happens with biotech stocks is that news is often kind of perceived as a important concept that, that with time... Um, the news should be irrelevant, but without new news, there's this long stretch of time where nothing happens, and that that's very that's sort of very common in um, in 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 biotech because or pharma because you have you have like six months or a year before you even start a clinical trial, and then it takes a year or two to do the clinical trial, and that's sort of something where investors lose patience, and that's where sort of you can make a lot of money. I often think is that. When people get nervous because 
oh, Avexis isn't going to have news for a year, so let me sell it now and buy it a year from now. Well, obviously that's sort of this uh, terrible fallacy because the value of the company doesn't change just because there's no news. It may be less exciting, it may be more boring, but that has nothing to do with the, the intrinsic value of the company. Avexis has basically a, a cure for um, spinal muscular atrophy. That's not going to change whether or not the drug gets approved this year or next year or the year after. Um, it, it basically doesn't make a difference um, as long as it does get approved. And um, that's sort of what's worth focusing on. And I, I think that the manufacturing issues, uh, which often uh, exist in almost every drug company that does a biologic drug, will be um, pretty surmountable and um, they'll sort of get get through to the other side. So I invested in some more in Avexis. Like most things, I mean, it makes sense to have, you know, for, for a biotech that's really risky with one product, I mean, this is about as big as I think one should get. You should never have five or 10 or 15% of your portfolio in a biotech stock that could disappear tomorrow. I think that's kind of, um, you know, if you're gonna do that, I mean, just be, you know, you, you I know, I certainly know people who, who do that. I know a friend of mine who's sort of 5% of, is his limit for a company like this. But I think for me, it's it's sort of a um, a little a little much, you know. Five uh, percent is sort of a good limit um, for any position, and for me, Alexion is is a much bigger, less risky company. So is Gilead. Um, so I don't like shorting um, more than sort of buying or shorting more than sort of five percent of my portfolio um, if I can help it. Um, you know, there there are some times where it makes sense to break that rule, but I think it's it's a good rule to follow. Anyway, I also bought some Horizon, um, which I've been talking about for a week or two. Um, Twitter and Snapchat are two stocks I'm short. Um, I think uh, I just started these positions. I'm not gonna do too large of investments as, um, uh, as uh, maybe the healthcare stocks. I'm not um, a huge tech expert, but you know, I, I thought that, I think both stocks are overvalued. Um, I kind of think Twitter is less overvalued than Snapchat but uh, I think both are overvalued. And um, you know we'll sort of see, and kind of learn by doing, so we'll sort of see what happens there. Um, you know, nothing else really changed. Uh, Insight went up a lot, which, which hurt me quite a bit, but Medicine's Company and the other shorts did go down. So, um, you know, it was sort of uh, mostly uh, a bad week, but uh, you know, not terrible. And I've, I've got my exposure up from the 30s to the 40s, so we'll see if I can find some more ideas and get get up there some more. All right, so there was um, big news for the week was this Ionis data um, for this illness called FAP. That's not a typo. It's familial amyloidosis polyneuropathy, um, and they've had some, they had some sort of bad data there, and Elnilum may benefit. And Elnilum is a company I've often been skeptical of, uh, but it, it seems like it might might be along. Um, they also have uh, a few, they have a drug for porphyria, they have a drug for hemophilia. Um, it certainly seems like it could be maybe a young, a young Regeneron. Um, so uh, Elmylum, you know, certainly interesting to be an interesting long there. There was the Malincrot short attack. I love it when, when non-drug guys uh, attack drug companies and it just makes me laugh sometimes to hear some of the stuff that they, that they say. It's, uh, it's um, humorous. Uh, and that was still the case here. It was just people that don't understand drugs. Uh, Ramasazumab was is the sclerostin antibody from UCB and Amgen. Apparently, the, the there was enough of a problem there that uh, they're not going to get approval and they'll be delayed. Uh, that's a big bigger problem for UCB than Amgen, but um, certainly an interesting thing given the, the excitement excitement of that drug. Estella's bought this tiny company called Hogeda. Which is an NK3 antagonist for hot flashes, similar to Melinta. So I think this is actually going to be a huge market. Um, the the current estrogen drugs are not that exciting. We've talked about this before. Um, so anyway, I just point that out. Um, these could be really big drugs. Uh, in terms of international stocks, I do like I said, Estellus is a Japanese company. I do look at international stocks. Um, most healthcare stocks are in the U.S. But um, you know, I, I buy local shares of GSK, for instance, and uh, you know, I it's it's not uncommon for me to have a lot of foreign stocks. Um, I thought about trading Tencent this week, which is Hong Kong listed, doesn't even have a U.S. listing, so I don't mind uh, international stocks at all. In fact, it's a feature feature of mine. But right now, um, you know, I don't I don't have anything at the moment too international. 
Uh, Shire's uh, Diax acquisition turned out to, to look really good. It looks like they'll basically put their own drug out of business and a lot of others as well. So they paid $4 billion for it, so it seems like they're going to get their money's worth. Uh, Amgen's uh, migraine drug got uh, filed their NDA, so I think they'll be first out the gate um, with uh, with um, with respect to these uh, CGRP antibodies. It'll be really interesting to see kind of what happens with, with that race. Um, whether these will be massive drugs or not, I'm not sure, but it's, it's interesting to see Amgen come out on first come out first with their, their migraine antibody. And I think Eli Lilly is pretty close behind. In tech, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot that I saw. Um, but again, I had a very busy week and I didn't get a, a ton of time to look too much. Uh, I looked at uh, Alibaba's earnings results, which were quite good, as well as uh, Salesforce's uh, Workday reports in two weeks, but their stock went up enormously last week. It was kind of interesting. Uh, Apple has a has seems to have a glucose monitor, uh, maybe on their new watch, which is pretty, uh, that's the rumor at least, which would be pretty huge for people with type 1 diabetes. There aren't that many people with type 1 diabetes, so it's kind of a weird feature to make a medical device. Um, but, you know, it's sort of neither here nor there. Um, I'm sure Tencent has a level 3 ADR, but the liquidity is in, is in the local. Um, anyway, the Google uh, AI rollout um, is kind of interesting. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but Google's sort of on Gmail for your mobile, it'll, it'll actually answer emails for you or give you suggested answers for emails, which is really amazing. I actually spent, uh, um, I, I responded to almost all my emails on Gmail with Google's automated responder. It's not perfect, but it's pretty incredible to, uh, to sort of see that uh, um, you can, you know, someone asked me, are you okay because of the car accident here in Times Square? Uh, I live a few blocks from Times Square, so my friend asked me, are you okay? Were you, you know, I'm just asking because of the Times Square thing, and I just clicked a pre-populated response, yeah, I'm fine, and it sent it right away. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so I think that, um, you know, was, was sort of notable and neat, and there have been some articles about it rolling out increasingly. Let's do some Q&A. Uh, again, this, this stream might be a little short. Um, you can always email me at martin at thoughtpatrol.com, T-H-O-T patrol.com. This comes from a sim. It's not a question so much as it is um, very uh, generous. The guy, uh, very, very kind. He actually looks like the same exact keyboard as me. And... Um, has uh, uh, got some nunchucks, a chess book, and, and some finance books, and he said, I want to be just like you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, very flattered. I think we maybe even have the same computer. So this is my, my doppelganger, apparently. Um, let's get to some real questions. Uh, Pat asked about the auto bubble uh, and auto loans and so forth. I, I certainly have noticed it. Some people on my, my team have noticed it. Um, I, I don't really you know, know how to play it or, or really care about it. Um, what do you do when the stock is going against you? Uh, I asked two questions. Has anything changed? Um, is really the, the main question, in fact, one question. Uh, and if something hasn't changed, then just be patient. If something's changed, just get out uh, of your position and just don't worry about it. A lot of people focus on, like, what price did they get in? What price did they get out? How much are they going to lose, et cetera? That, is, that stuff doesn't matter. Just get just get out. You know, that that's sort of the... Um, you know, especially if it's you know, don't let your don't let your trades become investments, and don't let your investments become trades. That's sort of an important concept to learn. Um, will there be a twenty seventeen crash? This comes from uh, Tommy. Uh, crashes are unpredictable, and, and there's always somebody you'll look backwards and say, oh, that person was predicting the crash or whatever. I, I don't see a crash coming myself, but um, you know, it's it's sort of a silly bit of a silly question. I get a lot of Bitcoin questions. This is a really cool chart that makes me a little more bullish on Bitcoin. Basically, um, the value of gold is about six trillion, I want to say, and the value of Bitcoin is maybe sixty or I don't know something, not not much, thirty billion. Yeah, thirty, thirty. Hold on. I think it's thirty billion. Yeah, and the value of of um, gold is six trillion. So if you think about it, gold. Uh, people ask me. People used to ask me about gold a lot. Gold is kind of this barbaric relic, I think one person put it very poetically, um, that uh, um, basically means nothing, does nothing, and it's just something that's sort of shiny and desirable, but, but not really useful in any way, shape, or form, and uh, other than occasional use in semiconductors and so forth. Um, gold doesn't have a practical value that's anywhere near um, its cost um, and uh, or its price. And so Bitcoin is actually 
somewhat useful. It's this anonymous currency, there's this blockchain, it sort of represents the value of, I'm still learning this stuff, but it kind of represents the value of some computing power unit. Um, so arguably there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, more money that can go into Bitcoin, but that doesn't necessarily mean the price will go up. Keep that in mind as well. Um, demand, in, in, when it comes to a currency, demand and price are not as correlated as, as they are in, say, good. So one has to think about that a, a little more carefully. But yeah, gold, uh, Bitcoin could hit a, a lot higher price. And certainly when it comes to sort of fiat and um, things that could have value, certainly Bitcoin looks like it's in the right direction. And certainly there's this concept of momentum investing where Bitcoin has a lot of momentum. So I kind of think that uh, Bitcoin is probably, um, probably worth speculating in. But again, I wouldn't make it more than a 1% or 2% position. Some people, it's all they think about. Um, it's a speculative investment like any other kind of speculative investment. I wouldn't worry about it too hard. I get a lot of questions about nootropics. They're invariably from people that um, seemingly need some intellectual boost. Um, I focus on uh, intelligence without any augmentation. Try to read uh, books and uh, learn things. Don't, 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 there's no easy way out. If you're hoping for an easy way out, there's uh, very little that uh, little hope for you. Um, you know, uh, I don't really believe in that there are any drugs that that increase uh, intelligence. But um, again, I, I I feel bad for people who ask that question. How do I keep up with news on healthcare for Matthew? Well, this is what I do: make a long list of healthcare stocks. Here's my list. It's it's pretty long. It's almost every drug stock, and then I have a page for non-drug stocks about four or five hundred public drug stocks so I make a list of all of them and then I would kind of um, uh, read all the press releases sign up for press releases update your models so a model is just a page with your forecasts and news and things like that and then um, you know you, Twitter is actually a pretty good tool for, for investing as well and invest and and you'll you'll the news will keep up with you and vice versa David asks what's the best method for the scuttlebutt network well you need to build a network uh, uh, the scuttlebutt method only works with a network. So you have to build up your network. Uh, you have to be gregarious, talk to a lot of people, meet a lot of people. Otherwise, scuttlebutt's not going to be uh, too useful if you're just talking to yourself or maybe your cat. So anyway, uh, Donatello wrote a really profound email where he says, you know, I grew up in the 07, 08, 09 time frame where, you know, a lot of uh, investments cracked and there, there was a global malaise and this and that, and I'm very skeptical of investing. What would you say? And I'd say, keep being skeptical. You know, uh, shorting is exactly... Uh, what what's uh, you know if, if you just experienced the success of the last set six or seven or eight years you may get lulled into this uh, conformity or this complacency that investing is a, is a really sort of simple um, thing to do and stocks always go up they don't and so having the right amount of longs and the right amount of shorts will help you um, balance your portfolio so if the market tanks you at least have some protection or actually make even more money so we'll see Igor asked about the value of an MBA I, I couldn't tell you for you, uh, for everyone it's different, it depends on who you are. Sometimes an MBA is the biggest waste of time you could ever contemplate. Sometimes it's really fantastic. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really up to you. Um, and I can tell you. What's the most complex topic in finance? Yasin asked an interesting question here. So finance is difficult because it's so simple um, <laughs> and that um, you're forecasting and, and forecasting is much more of an art than a science, but when it comes to science, there's plenty of scientific parts of, of investing, like factor modeling um, and all kinds of stochastic time series analysis, analysis that's not simple, especially with the volume of data. So, um, you know, there, there are sophisticated, so to speak, parts of finance, but really finance is this small, abstracted, um, not abstracted, in fact, it's a small, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, practical, you know, kind of... Uh, branch of statistics and math that, that's just very finite. Um, it's, its complexity comes from um, its unpredictability and, and just sort of the human psychology and all these other things. So that's why, you know, for me, um, healthcare um, and pharmacology, things like that are sort of where, um, you know, the detail and the complexity comes in, but the actual practicality of finance is, is great. The problem is that it's so practical and simple that people want to sort of either not do the work that you do have to do and make it almost too simple. Um, like people who buy stocks when news is good or people who sell stocks when news is bad and they don't think about price and value, for instance. Um, you know, 
and, and that takes a little bit of work, but not too much work. Or, or people get too sort of complex with finance and they miss the, the bigger picture. So it's, it's not too easy. Someone asked me about nano cell based cancer drug delivery. Um, please don't mean me anymore. Uh, Rachel asked about raising money for drug development through donations. I don't think it's possible. There's drugs cost so much money. And if you look at Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, they actually did help create uh, the new cystic fibrosis drug, but most of that money came from Vertex. Uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Association has raised a lot of money. We don't have a single treatment or anything that even looks good for muscular dystrophy. So I just don't see that happening. Uh, how do you learn the program? Same, same person who asked the first question. I think you just dive in, learn the language and start programming and trying out uh, programming and just keep, uh, keep kind of uh, developing. Will you learn how to drive so you can play gangsta music while doing so? I think that's a great idea. What do you think about defense stocks? I have no idea. I haven't looked at these stocks since I was a kid. Uh, any concern on U.S. valuations? I'm not concerned. Um, uh, there's good growth, uh, and that growth is driven by productivity. Uh, maybe the, the labor market gives is so tight that there's some cause for concern. But um, there's no individual stock that, that looks too... To worrisome uh, from what I can sell you know so so whenever I think about markets being extended I actually look at individual stocks and ask myself if the markets are extended most of my stocks should be shorts and uh, I don't see that um, the consumer isn't leveraged banks aren't leveraged there's there's no, real estate's just starting to get back to 07 highs so I think the market has a ways to go but I'm not a macro guy I like to stay neutral um, so you know but I, I don't have too much concern uh, what do I follow? Publications and resources. Uh, I would um, look at any press releases for any companies that you follow. That's the number one thing. And then any high impact factor journal. If you don't know what an impact factor is, now is a good time to go find out. Um, but things like Nature, New England Journal, Science, Lancet, etc. All right, what to read? Well, this is some of the stuff that I've been reading in the last week. Um, Khan Academy is, is, is great. A lot of people um, get sort of embarrassed by reviewing basics. I think the way to master anything is to have a solid fundamental understanding of the basics. So I also got two books in the mail, um, Principles of Statistics, which is written 50 years ago, and then uh, General Chemistry by Linus Pauling, which was also uh, published a long time ago. Um, can't go wrong with uh, anything by Linus Pauling, can you? Um, but again, I think that, that a lot of mastery comes from really not mastering the most advanced parts of things, but actually the most fundamental parts of things. And that some of the very basic um, things that I've seen in finance or, or pharmacology, areas that I really understand well, um, are actually the things that, that so-called experts miss the most. So in pharmacology, I can't, I can't tell you how many mistakes are made with the very rudimentary and simplistic core concepts that are easy to gloss over. And I think the same applies in other fields. I'm not a master chemist, and I'm certainly no statistician or mathematician, but I think that um, if you want to master anything in life, there, there is this fundamental uh, foundation that, that, that you have to build. And um, I'm never embarrassed to sort of look over something that maybe I learned 10 or 15 years ago uh, and, and continue to do it. There's a great curve of how memory works, and it requires constant, um, uh, constant reinforcement. And so anyway, um, don't forget about reinforcing. I think it's really important. Uh, Turing completeness of PowerPoint was a really funny uh, um, paper that's been making the rounds. Uh, you would not think PowerPoint is a programming language, but it's uh, remarkably uh, Turing complete, uh, if you know what that phrase from computing is. Anyway, I did promise this one would be a little shorter. If anyone has any burning questions, now's the time to shoot them over, I'll glance at uh, email, um, which is martin at thoughtpatrol.com. Make sure you sign up as a beta user for my new uh, company, godel.systems. You do have to sign a con confidentiality agreement, which is now electronically automated. So you are contractually obligated to keep the secret. And then I do have a new Twitter, which is BLM Bro. Uh, please add me or follow me or whatever. I'm sure it'll be banned soon, but I'll, I'll keep making new Twitters. And maybe, maybe I'll sue Twitter, who knows. Um, but yeah, sign up for Godel. Um, I'm going to go look at the email to see if there's any interesting emails. It's uh, martin at thoughtpatrol.com. T-H-O-T-P-A-T-R-O-L.com. All right. What books would you recommend as an informative start to investing? Uh, there's one really good book, I think, um, 
called uh, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. It's by Phil Fisher. I'd recommend that. Uh, invitation to Speak at Temple University. Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, let's see, let's see. Do you use sharp ratios? Sure. Um, risk and uh, return are very important to contextualize. You can't just look at return and imply success without thinking about risk. Now, sharp ratios, the problem with sharp ratios is they look at volatility as the measure of risk when things like VAR value at risk and, and other there are other better ways to measure risk. Like even if something as simple as exposure is a great way to uh, contextualize risk and, and make sure that um, you know you don't have um, over-reliance on sharp. For instance, you can have a good sharp ratio by simply selling premium. Selling premium nonstop will result in a good sharp ratio, but inevitably when vol picks up, it, you'll you'll <laughs> you lose all your money, and your sharp ratio was not predictive. Uh, short squeeze myth. I do think short squeezes are a myth. Um, you can sort of try to crowd out a security by buying it, but you'd be surprised at how the quantitative investing world now sort of knows that you're doing that and can often um, step in and provide liquidity on the other side, sometimes without borrowing the security or, and so forth. So there, there are a lot of loopholes around that and I don't think short, short squeezes really happen in, in real life. And also the hard to borrow nature of stocks results in the easy shorts being quite expensive to actually um, make work. All right, reading recommendations for this week. Well, I gave you a few. Um, let's see here. Also, do you beta weight your portfolio? Um, I definitely look at if my, my portfolio is any factor, has any factor that's too too much uh, exposure, like um, uh, even exposure to a sector um, or a country or you know um, a, a level like uh, all pre 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 commercial biotech. If you're long all pre commercial biotech and you're short all pharma, you're not really hedged, so to speak. You're really making a factor bet. Um, Opinion on Joel Greenblatt, I don't really know um, that person. Um, all right, so you, I, I like this one. Uh, this is from, um, hold on one second. Dimitri, you're mentioning over beers once how you and your friend locked up in a garage and were distilling some core principles of finance. Could you expand a bit more on the process and what you guys arrived at? And what was that parallel to martial arts all about? Well, um, I think to, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, it's hard to say, but um, in 08 and 09, uh, one of my best friends and I really, I think, studied finance so in such deep sort of, uh, in such a deep way that we became, uh, you know, really, I think, you know, we, we took our investing knowledge to the next level and it required this really deep meditation, if you will, on finance. And it, it reminds me of martial arts um, in many ways. And, um, you know, I won't bore you with some of those details because they're almost a little too mystical. But um, I do think if you really want to understand something, you have to have not just a, a dedication and a, a willingness to put in the time and the effort, but you also have to understand things on a metaphysical level. And that sounds so weird. Uh, it may be um, a little silly, but um, I, I have to say that 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 bonding experience of of having just sort of two years to sit and really focus together on um, on meditating on on how finance really happens, investing particularly, especially in equities, and what it really means. It, it was um, it was formative, and uh, I, I almost missed that and, and want to go back to it. Um, and it was like a, a martial arts type discipline. Um, Anyway, you know, maybe maybe uh, maybe I will go back to that. We'll see. Let's see what else. If the markets are super smart, then why does arbitrage exist? I think they mostly uh, there aren't too many arbitrages. Um, private equity has more arbitrage. There's no quantitative investors, for instance, in private equity. Um, you know, but there isn't that much arbitrage. You know, you have to look pretty hard to find good arbitrage. All right, Nicholas, do you think that there's some overthinking in stocks? Shouldn't it be more basic? No, nope. it's really hard. <laughs> you gotta think and look really hard. Do you think all time high of New York Stock Exchange margin debt is concerning? Um, I'll have to look at it, but though that number could be influenced by many different things, but it certainly is, is a little concerning, sure. Do you think Apple's glucose meter will be sensitive and precise enough? Probably not, um, we'll see, we'll have to see. 
it's not trivial engineering, but you know, Apple's got good engineers, so we'll see. Um, all right. I think the CAPE ratio is a good question from Angel here of cyclically adjusted PE ratio. Longest bull market we have ever been in. That's not true at all. There have been 20 year bull markets. Uh, this is from B grade. There have been 30 year bull markets. So don't, don't get too excited just yet. Um, and I do think the concept that bear markets could be over with is possible. Again, humans are, are a little too impatient and have these greed, greed fear phenomenons. With computers now being what 30% of all trading according to today's Wall Street Journal, it's possible that, that we could be seeing the end of the bear market, but even computers can get um, irrational, so we'll see. All right, I think I've got um, all of these questions. Um, I get asked about Joe Rogan's podcast like every day. I, I would love to go on it. Um, but um, so I'll end a little early here. Uh, this is about 50 minutes. I really appreciate you guys joining. I will see you guys next week, same time, same place. Thanks again.